Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's board meeting. The date is April, Tuesday, April 24th, 2018. And I want to remind you to turn off your cell phones because this um, meeting is being recorded. Ellen, can you please do the roll call for us? Thank you, Chairperson Granado. Good evening, everyone. <coughs> Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Present. Mr. Healy? Here. Ms. McCurdy? Here. Ms. Moon? Here. Mr. Morris? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Here. Vice Chairperson, Mr. Hill? Here. Chairperson, Mrs. Granado? Here. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative, Mr. Justin Bianchi? Here. All present. Thank you, Ellen. I want to invite a group from the Highcrest Elementary School to come on up to the front and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Emmett, I understand we have two recognitions tonight, starting with Highcrest? We do. We have uh, our group from Highcrest Elementary School, our student council, which uh, is here to present on uh, what they're doing over at Highcrest. Come on up, students. So this is a wonderful group of students who represent our student council. So it's a sixth grade group of students who would like to speak to you about what it means to be in high, student council at Highcrest and what they've learned from the experience. So thank you very much. I also, my apologies, I also want to acknowledge our advisors who are here with us tonight. Mrs. Rodriguez, our school psych psychologist. Mrs. Winarski, who you might know. <laughs> we also have two teachers here in support, um, Mr. Ryan Boothroyd in the back and Mr. Christopher Fox in the <coughs> Hi, I'm Sophia. And what is student council exactly? Student council is a group of students that try to make Highcrest School a more fun and safe place. In student council, we help out our events, fundraisers, and more. For example, we laminate papers for teachers, print copy papers for classrooms, or help kids with their reading walks. We help out with fundraisers like the pink out and mitten tree. Here at Student Council, we try to encourage hard work and fun at Highcrest School. Student Council means being committed to helping your school and community. It's being open to help with any task at hand. Throughout the year, Student Council helps with and organizes several fundraisers and events benefiting both our school and our community. Here are the events we have held this year. So in October, we held the Pink Out, which supports breast cancer awareness, and also we made Halloween cards for Brock, who is a cancer patient from Maine. In December, we did our annual mitten tree collection for the Weathersfield Social Services, our Jingle Bell Run Toy Drive, and our Pajama Day for CCMC. In February, we did our Red Out for the American Heart Association. In March, we did a readathon to raise money for new books. In April, we did Light It Up Blue Day for Autumn Awareness, Jump Rope for Heart, in an upcoming events in May, we're doing new hallway mural and celebrity readers. So this is a pink a picture from our pink out. And so the pink out is for Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October, and we actually raised over three hundred dollars. This is a picture from our Jingo Bow run. We donated Toys to families who can't afford holiday presents. We collected 137 toys. And this is a picture from our uh, most recent event, our Lighted Up Blue Day for Autism Awareness. 
our student council members sold bracelets for autism awareness for a dollar each and we raised over $400. What does it mean to be a student council member? These are some questions on what it takes to be a student council member. Will you commit to the responsibilities of being a student council member? Why do you want to be a student council member? What can student council do to make High Crest Elementary School the best place to go to school? What are some good ideas you would like to share with student council? Do you have any experience with similar groups? These are some questions students were asked when applying for student council. Joining student council is one thing that you'll never regret. Being surrounded by admirable friends is something that you'd want to do all the time, which you get to do in student council. Furthermore, we, we students help, help out with hosting the most exciting events to ever be. And all it takes is responsibility to help uh, the community become a friendlier and more extraordinary place for students to come and feel welcome. And that is why we as students join student council to become a, a part of making school a better place. The purpose of purpose and why we joined. The purpose of student council is to help out with school activities or any extra things our teachers need help with. We do things that teachers may feel like they need a extra, little extra help with or it just may be something for students to do for a change. We, jo we joined Student Council to give back to our school for all that it has given us. Field trips, fundraisers, field day, and so much more. We also joined because we felt we the need to help out the school. This would leaving have us leaving the school next year feeling like we were able to help out and make a change. The Student Council helps assist many school-wide activities. These include fundraisers that the school helps out put together, such as the Red Out, the Pink Out, and Lighted Up Blue Day. We helped by making sure everyone knew about all the events we had. We did this by writing morning announcements and creating posters. On Light Up Blue Day for Autism Awareness, members of Student Council handed out bracelets to all who donated a dollar to <coughs> Autism Awareness. The Student Council also helped with the Jingle Bell Run, and not to mention, we also organized the presents that were donated to children. And lastly, we helped make hot chocolate and hand out cookies for the runners. Fundraisers and activities. Throughout the school year, we raise money for several important causes. For example, in December, we do an after-school jingle bar run, bringing toys in for children whose families cannot afford holiday gifts. Other activities include Jump Rope for Heart for children with heart disease, and as said in the previous slide, Pink Out, Red Out, and Light It Up Blue Day. To raise money for CCMC, we have an annual pajama day to bring in mon a dollar to help sick children. The sixth grade student council finds fun ways to raise money for an important cause. Future te teacher opportunities. <coughs> Some of the jobs given to student council by staff and teacher include laminating for teachers, making copies for our character trait of the month flyers, helping kindergartners in the morning. We also help second graders with sight words and make copies for our school-wide readathon. As student council, we support our teachers and student body and we hope our small contribution makes a big difference at our school. The High Crest Student Council would like to thank the Weathersfield Board of Education for inviting us tonight. This has been a great opportunity this school year to help out, and as we move on to the middle school, we hope to continue helping others and making a difference in our school, community, and the world. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. Okay, thank you. We did enjoy your presentation, and I thought, as I was listening to all and reading all the things you do, what a great lesson in time management you're getting before you go to middle school. So congratulations on all the work you did. Thank you. Thank you, teachers. Thank you. Anybody else comments? Okay. Uh, also this evening, Mrs. Granada, we have some champions among us. Uh, if I could please have our um, champion students, along with Mr. Maltesi, please come forward for a presentation on uh, sports at WHS.
Thank you, Superintendent Emmett, Chair P Person Granado, and members of the Board of Education. I'd like to thank you again for having me and giving me an opportunity to share what we do here at the high school uh, in our athletic programs uh, every, every day after school. I'm very fortunate and glad to have uh, four of our swim captains with me. We have uh, Blake Fulton, we have Maura Stewart, Amanda Tugas, and Pat McGuane. Uh, for people who have served in a leadership role, which I'll talk about uh, briefly in a minute. But what's special about the teams this year, our swim teams this year, through uh, both of their grueling, very long seasons, <coughs> as uh, they won again another CCC conference uh, championship and also have a distinction of being undefeated during the regular season as well prior to the state tournament. So I think uh, that certainly deserves a, a round of applause at their hard work. Uh, <laughs> It cer certainly paid off. Um, as I have in the past, when I presented the Board of Education, I do have students with me here to answer some questions really in the student voice. They're the ones doing all the hard work. They're the ones that practice every day, getting home late at night, then getting into homework mode, uh, hopefully grabbing a, a quick bite to eat, and then heading off to bed and, and doing it all again uh, the next day of the week and even into the weekend. So there will be some time at the end. If you have questions for our student athletes, feel free to, uh, to ask them. And I know a few of them have uh, some statements they prepared. But I would like to talk a little bit about what has happened in the fall and winter seasons this year, 2017-18, and just a quick uh, snapshot of our current spring season, which we are, which we are in. Um, just some quick information for those of you new to the Board of Education. The athletic department is comprised of myself, also an assistant principal at the high school. I have an administrative secretary, uh, Andrew Zazola, who is, is wonderful, along with an athletic trainer through Hartford Hospital every day after school. We do have a presence uh, at social media. We have a Facebook page, a Twitter page, and in talking to these four uh, um, young, young leaders, uh, we're working on an Instagram page as well because I think Facebook and Twitter have, have gone to the wayside with some of our, our younger population. There are a lot of benefits with interscholastic athletics. Um, some of I had mentioned here today. I think uh, first and foremost, though, is just being able to represent your school and community in such a positive light. Um, some things, and again, I'll talk about in the PowerPoint, where we're able to, in fact, give back to the town of Wethersfield. Wethersfield just does a, a great job of being supportive, and the, the kids are certainly uh, advocates of, of, of their town and, and just great role models for, for the youth. Uh, we talk about teamwork and goal setting, time management. I heard earlier about these uh, young people from, from Highcrest and hope to see them in, in three short years up at Wethersfield High School. Certainly physical fitness, um, competition, and leadership skills. And again, I have our captains here today. We have a great participation rate at Weathersfield High School. We see over a thousand unique, uh, I'm sorry, a thousand different registrations across the three seasons, about 600 different unique athletes that participate each, uh, each year. And these are our fall numbers uh, this, this, past, uh, this past fall. With that, we always emphasize anytime we're talking with our, with our kids at the high school, the importance of being a student athlete. And I ask the kids a very easy question, and, and they usually get it right. And being a student athlete, which, which part of that word comes first, and it truly is, is student. We do want them to focus on the academics during the school day and then excel on the fields or in the pool um, on, on the court in the afternoon. But we were fortunate enough to have a, over 100 athletes a fall alone be named to the CCC, the Central Connecticut Conference All Academic <clears throat> Team. So we do really try to stress the importance of academics as, as well as athletics. Uh, we do excel, however. Uh, in the pool, on the court, in the field. We had 35 different all-conference selections uh, this past fall, and we had members uh, of, of each different sport that we offer. We offer 10 different sports in the fall. We offer 10 different sports in the winter. And this year, with the addition of club lacrosse, we have 11 different sports to offer our, our young people in the, in the spring. Uh, we had three different students be named to the all-state uh, Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference team, uh, Brendan Berry and boys soccer, Abby Francis in girls swim and dive, and Maya Mahalan in, in field hockey. Uh, and we had many, many uh, championship teams. I had already uh, given some recognition to our girls swim and dive team, um, an undefeated season, knocking off rival Glastonbury, and, and how many years was it? 18 or 19 years. So before some of these kids were, were even born, the last time we knocked off uh, uh, our friends across the river. Uh, we also won a league title in boys soccer, third consecutive title for Rob Yakum and his his boys' teams. Girls' soccer won a uh, league title again this year. Our girls' cross-country team um, so. did. Uh, we also continued with our unified sports program. We have many of our uh, athletes who give up some time right after school to work with some of our special ed population. This year, we're able to offer unified soccer, 
unified basketball, unified um, volleyball this year. And we also have some fun. So take away some of the competition, just going out for just some pure enjoyment. We again ran a powder puff uh, tournament this past fall. We had uh, teachers, we had freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and this year, I believe our senior class took home the trophy again, which they were, <laughs> they were pretty proud of, two consecutive year there. Um, you talk about fierce competition, and I think if you are down at a powder puff game, and that might be some of the hardest you've seen some of our kids uh, go all, all fall. Um, we have a pep rally every, every fall to kind of kick off our, our fall season, and we get everybody involved. Uh, obviously, we have our athletes there we're recognizing. We have a performance by the, the dance team. We have a performance by the cheerleading team. But we also started to center it around um, a kickoff for our marching band. So we try to incorporate the marching band who uh, gives so much back to the athletic program as well. And we just have some, some great fun teachers, students alike, uh, involved in the pep rally every, every fall. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, giving back to the community, uh, not only Weathersfield, but really other people less fortunate th than us. We had some uh, horrific disasters this past fall, if we remember, six months ago with the floods in, in Puerto Rico and the floods in, in Texas and, and Florida. So many of our athletes were involved in our fall clothing drive. Uh, we had a big food drive uh, we, we conducted over the weekend. Uh, and uh, one special little girl from Charles Wright, as, as we all probably remember, really touched the lives of many of our, our football families. And we just did a lot of work with, with Maven's uh, family and, and giving back to that uh, uh, fighting cancer in Maven's name. And then she uh, came out and flipped a coin at our first home game this year. And uh, she was invited to many of our pasta dinners, sitting at the table with you know, 6'4", 6'5", 300-pound uh, <laughs> linemen. And she was the center of attention and just uh, really stole the show and stole everybody's heart, anybody who had an opportunity to meet her. So just being able to give back and, uh, and just make such a – an impact, uh, what she did, made an impact on all, all of our lives, anybody that she, that she touched. Uh, similar to Highcrest, we were involved in what we call it the high school Pinktober. This is the fifth year we've been involved in, in again, giving back and raising awareness surrounding uh, breast cancer. Um, and this year our shirts were titled Weathersfield Cares, if you can check them out on the, on the, on the PowerPoint. Um, we ended the year again with our, with our Thanksgiving football game. Uh, it was really just a great community event. And again, you talk about a Friday night, whether it is a field hockey, whether it's girls or boys soccer or football, but it really becomes just a town event over on Cachone Field and in the whole stadium, whether it's uh, you know, young people, five, six years old, up to alumni from, from a few years back. Uh, everybody comes out and really just supports the kids. So we ended our fall season with uh, some Thanksgiving football and a very close and competitive game with, with our rivals from, from Newington. Um, the last thing we did in conjunction with uh, the NFL, Mr. Sand, one of our, our teachers who, who, again, does a lot of involvement, um, was able to work with the New York Jets. And we honored every week um, an upstander uh, of Weathersfield High School. And through teacher nominations, any student uh, who really went above and beyond for a variety of reasons was honored as the upstander of the week. And they were awarded uh, a few free tickets to the New York Jets, uh, not the New York Football Giants, but the New York Jets. Uh, <laughs> stadium uh, for, for a game. Uh, moving over to our winter season, uh, again, we had a, another very successful season in terms of participation, almost 300 students, as, as well as some, uh, some, some champions, uh, which I'll get to as well. Uh, we had 84 athletes make the all-academic team, 34 named to the uh, all-conference team. All-state, uh, led by uh, Blake Fulton, along with some of his teammates, Austin Bovino, Haddon Gaunt in diving, Holden Hoon, and Caleb Skronik. Uh, we're named to the All-State in Boys Swim. Uh, we had three young ladies named to the All-State uh, gymnastics team, and they had a phenomenal year as, as well. Uh, George Stoughton uh, mm -hmm. was a two-time All-State winner in indoor track, while Michael Mazzucato in boys basketball and Cam Partridge and Trevor Pasewicz in, in ice hockey. Our championship teams, again, the winter led off with Boys Swim and Dive, uh, an undefeated season. Mm -hmm. And as successful as the swim teams have been and probably our most successful over the last um, 20 years. Only, uh, I think, a handful of our teams have been undefeated in the regular season. So to have both the men and women's do it in the same year, again, is quite remarkable. Boys basketball won their first CCC conference championship. The cheerleading team won a conference championship and came in second out of the 31 schools um, that, that competed, which is uh, qu quite a feat. Uh, and gymnastics won another league title. And this was the first year we were able to sponsor a bowling team that went to the CIC. Uh, tournament over in Newington at, at Bolorama. 
So we were uh, proud to be able to send a team there as, as well. Again, giving back to the community, the hockey team, really led by uh, Michael Gianfrido, one of our seniors, uh, did a military appreciation game uh, over the Christmas, uh, Christmas uh, or ho sorry, holiday vacation. And we honored uh, any, anybody who had served in the military, any alumni from both Newington and Weathersfield teams um, at, at the game in, in Newington. And we also had our boys basketball team get back to Webb Elementary School and during Read Across America Day went in and read to some of our elementary school kids. So again, just that whole community piece we think is probably the most important of, of what we're able to do and look back at uh, all the different lives we've, we've, we've touched. Uh, we started spring sports already. Uh, if you check your thermometer, you might be thinking <laughs> it's still a second winter season, but uh, we have been outside. We've, we've uh, been off and going. We have over 350 kids involved in some of our uh, athletic teams. That doesn't include the club teams, another 40 or so uh, young women and young men involved in, in club lacrosse. With that, you know, we're so proud of what, what they're able to do here at Weathersfield. We're very proud that they're able to go off and uh, speak about what, what a great opportunity they had at Weathersfield High School. And many of our kids go on and compete at the college level. We've had quite a few signings already this year, and I have a few um, here. Kendall Cathcart in girls soccer. Um, Chloe Troy is going to uh, girls soccer and girls tennis. Uh, Jackie Sampsey is going to be uh, competing for track and field team at Regis, and we have three uh, baseball players actually heading to play uh, Division I baseball next year. Jimmy Sullivan at Virginia, Timmy Blaisdale at University of Hartford, and Tyler Fody at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh, and it goes, again, it goes back really to what this town has to offer for, for all of our residents, how supportive they are of not only the school system, but the athletic de department. As many of you know, we were able to put in and resurface our turf field, just a picture of it here. Uh, where all of our teams, it truly is a multi-purpose uh, turf complex. We're able to, to use that uh, daily and really all three seasons. We're even out there in the winter when, uh, when the weather permits. And again, it's with our, our student body support uh, at all of our contests, whether it's the natatorium, the gymnasium, outdoors in the stadium is, uh, you know, is great. Again, the one last thing is, is getting out there and meeting some other people, trying to network as much as possible in attending some conferences, talking to other schools, other athletic directors. I've been able to work with my colleagues, Mr. Moore, Dr. DeVivo, Mr. Komar, and, and using, again, some of these connections and, and colleges and people we've, we've met. Uh, we've been able to do some different partnerships and uh, continue that education to our students. And we've brought some uh, pretty important programs to our school. We've talked about social media. We've talked about the issues with vaping. We've talked about NCAA eligibility and, and playing college athletics along with the, uh, the horrible op opioid addictions that are um, you know, really just ev everywhere right now we're trying to combat, as well as just the other day, we talked about uh, distracted driving uh, as, as prom season and, and spring season and, and graduation is here. So um, sorry if I went a little bit too fast. I know you have a, a pretty tight agenda today, but okay. that is really the athletic department in, in a nutshell. And again, I do have uh, my, my student athletes here who would love to say a few words and answer any questions you have. And if you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer those as well. Okay. I don't know if, uh, Maura, you had something you wanted yeah, to say? Yeah, so does Amanda, too. Great. Hi, my name is Maura Stewart, and I live at 411 Main Street. As one of the captains of the WHS Girls Swim and Dive Team, I'm speaking on behalf of the entire team when I say we all take pride in representing Weathersfield High School in the town of Weathersfield. Though challenging in many ways, we met those challenges head on, and both the girls and boys swim and dive teams were undefeated in conference chance this past season. This is the first time in WHS history where both the boys and girls swim and dive teams were undefeated in the same season. The friendships we have made in participating in interscholastic in sports like swim and swimming and diving are invaluable. These swimmers are my closest friends and we have a bond that will continue after high school. I want to thank the Board of Ved and the Town Council, but especially Mr. Maltesi, Mr. Emmett, and Mr. Moore for their support of the WHS swim and dive teams. Thank you for getting the pool open for us so we could practice and swim this year, and thank you for the new starting blocks. Though the captains and many others will be graduating this year, I'm sure the rest of the swimmers and divers will continue on this legacy and make the town and WHS proud. Thank you. Okay, my name is Amanda Tuvius, and I live at 111 Colonel Chester Drive, and I was also one of the captains this season, and it was an honor to lead this amazing group of girls along with my two co-captains because we had one of the best seasons we ever had. 
My last four years swimming at WHS has taught me so many valuable lessons like setting goals for myself and never giving up on challenges that once seemed impossible. And I also established relationships with my teammates and coaches that showed me how important it is to put your trust in other people and put the team before yourself. And I plan on carrying these values with me when I swim in college next year. The athletic program at Wethersfield High School is really special because you can really tell how much time and effort is put into every meet and game and how they bring a community together. And I would like to thank all of you for consider continuing to support Wethersfield Athletics. Thank you, ladies. And Lord, I don't know if you had any questions for our... Go ahead, Ginger. I don't really have any questions, but I would like to thank you for bringing swimmers here. I uh, happen to know that at least two of these swimmers started swimming when there were barely competition suits small enough for them <laughs> um, because I used to work at Pine Acres and I see those moms over there who used to see me standing by the side of the pool yelling at my daughter to stop breathing. <laughs> um, so I know how hard you've worked and I know how many years you've worked to do it, so congratulations. Anyone else? Well, I want to congratulate all of you also, and I set it up here um, a couple months ago. Nothing brings a town together like pride in our Wethersfield High School sports. I was there Friday night, and I was watching baseball, and they had the track, and they had softball. It, it really is a community event on those fields on a nice spring night, um, which we don't have too many of. But congratulations to all of you for everything you've done. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Next on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes of our regular Board of Ed meeting on March 27, 2018. Anybody see any corrections? Okay. May I have a motion to approve those minutes? So, so moved. moved. Okay, a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? <coughs> any abstentions? Those minutes are approved. And we continue also on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes of our special Board of Ed retreat meeting on March 28, 2018. Does anyone see any corrections? I have one correction. I arrived um, late. I'm sorry. I she arrived late. late. Oh. Like, there's 10 minutes left in the meeting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. But I was in negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. May I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, those minutes are approved. And finally, the approval of the minutes of a special Board of Ed meeting on April 3rd, 2018. Any corrections? Okay, may I have a motion? So, so moved. moved. Okay, a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Got John on that? So noted. Just two. Okay. One. Just one. Okay. Those minutes are approved. All right. Is there anyone wishing to make a public comment? Please come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you that public comments are limited to five minutes. Hi, my name is Anne Marie Rivera Berrios, and my address is 19-21 um, Chester Street in New Haven. Um, I am a special education teacher for Weathersfield Transition Academy, and um, I started in November. I have been a teacher for over 13 years and um, very dedicated. Um, during my time at Weathersfield, um, it should be noted that I have received 
zero teacher evaluations. And I also was not given access to the teacher evaluation system as well. Um, in hand, I have a letter dated April 19th, which I received um, today. It states that um, I would be put up for non-renewal in front of the board today. In addition, I have a letter from my attorney, John Williams, uh, dated April 21st, and I will read it. Please be advised that I represent Anne Marie Rivera Berrios. I have in hand your letter to my client dated April 19th, 2018. Wherein you, you advise that you intend to rec recommend the non-renewal of my client's teaching contract at the Board of Ed meeting <coughs> scheduled for April 24th, 2018. Pursuant to the provisions of Connecticut General Statute Section 10-151, I demand that you furnish my client through me with a written statement of the reasons or reason for um, the non-renewal recommendation. In addition, kindly advise the Board of Ed that we demand a hearing of the non-renewal recommendation. Said hearing to be conducted a reasonable period of time after you provide us with the reason or reasons for your recommendation. I also have in hand the facts that it was received. To date, we have not received any reasons, and um, I think we deserve that prior to any, um, any conclusion. Um, and I would also ask for a hearing. I think there's a lot going on related to this, and I think it's important that the board hear what's really happening. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, thank you. Mr. Emmett, you have communications to share? I do, thank you, Mrs. Granado. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening, the Board of Education will be taking action on the district's vision and mission, as well as our strategic plan that charts the course for the future. Thank you for your commitment to this process and also to staff, parents, and members of the Weathersfield community who provided input and feedback. The 60th annual WPS Art Show opens tomorrow at the Keeney Center with a reception from 6 o'clock to 7.30. The show will run from tomorrow through May 16th. I had the opportunity to attend the CMEA Honors Chorus Performance at the Hartford Convention Center this past Friday. In addition to the chorus performance on Friday, honors orchestra and band ensembles performed on Thursday. Weathersfield was very well represented with 20 students at the Honors Chorus, 15 in the Honors Orchestra, and 15 in the Honors Band. In addition to our students, our music teachers were also very well represented there as well. Last week uh, featured the town budget hearing as well as a joint meeting of the board and town council. Uh, at this point in time, we're still uh, awaiting a number from town council. Look forward to getting that shortly. As you all know, May 15th marks the point at which we uh, must have our allocation. So for planning purposes, we hope to uh, get that number soon. Uh, WHS was the site of a vaping panel discussion last Thursday evening. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Diana DeVivo and WHS psychologist Pam Harrison for coordinating this event. Uh, this is becoming an increasing, uh, increasingly large challenge uh, at the high school level as these devices become uh, smaller and uh, more and more difficult to detect. Uh, a visiting team from the Connecticut Association of Schools will be arriving at Dean on Thursday for a site visit. Uh, this is the part of the process for the CAS Middle School of the Year, of which Silas Dean is a semi-finalist. And just a reminder to the community that the last day of school is Friday, June 22nd. That's a minimum school day. And graduation is scheduled for Friday, June 22nd at 6 p.m. at the Cove. Should weather be a factor, the ceremony will be held within the main gym at Weathersfield High School. And as of tonight, there are a total of 42 days left in the 2017-18 school year. So it's fast. going, it's going fast, Justin, it's going fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for communications tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions? <laughs> okay, well, we have a lot of action items tonight, so we'll get started on them. Um, John Morris, are you ready? Would you read action item 6A for us? Take a deep breath. Okay. Move that the contract of employment of ID numbers 905 908, 906 183, 906 032, 905 863, 906 352, 
Non-tenure teachers not be renewed for the following school year upon expiration at the end of the 2017-2018 school year and that the superintendent of schools is directed to advise such persons in writing of this action. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, is there any discussion? John? Yeah, I, I don't know if I just couldn't hear it, but did you, would the proper number 906335, for some reason it sounded like 906325. 335. 335. Yes. Okay, just wanted to double check. I was just reading. It's not like I know them. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, that's <laughs> really memorized. good. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Polly? Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I just want to confirm, uh, because I know you have in the past, um, Mr. Emmett, that you have met with these teachers, and um, uh, so they're not just getting a letter, and I understand we have to notify in, in Teacher, writing that that's you correct. are correct. Teachers, them. yes, teachers have already been notified. Okay, yes. they have. And I, I just wanted to make the comment that um, is since I've been on the board, which is um, uh, a, starting my seventh year, but um, we've been fortunate in not having, in, or should I say, in being able to reinstate um, all of uh, the, our teachers that we've had to uh, um, non-renew at this time of the year. And I really, really hope that uh, uh, this is going to be something that once the budget has been completed, that we're going to be able to sit here at the board meeting following that and be able to uh, to renew everyone again because um, uh, we're, we're talking about a group of people who've come in over the last couple of years who brought so much energy and uh, enthusiasm to our school and uh, I think we need them. Mm. So, thank you. I agree. Any other discussion? John? Just to let the public know, this is something that we do every year. It's just for our protection as well and other communities do it. We're not the only community that are in this particular situation. So we're not, you know, this is for the Board of Education's protection. Anyone else? Okay, all in favor? Oh, Aye. Aye. we have a second. Oh, yep. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6A passes. John, can you read motion 6B for us? Move that the contract of employment of employee ID number 906369 not be renewed for the following school year upon expiration at the end of the 2017-2018 school year and that the superintendent of schools is directed to advise such person in writing of this action. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6B passes. 6C, Diane, would you read that for us? Yes. Move that for the 2018-19 fiscal year, the Wethersfield Board of Education continue to certify with the Connecticut State Department of Education 
that foods sold to students separately from reimbursable school meals will meet Connecticut nutrition standards and further move that the Board of Education will continue to allow exemptions for the sale of food items that do not meet the Connecticut nutrition standards provided. One, the sale is in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. Two, the sale is at a location of the event. Three, the food is not sold from a vending machine or school store. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion on this? This is a annual requirement by the Connecticut State Department of Education. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6C passes. Hey, Chris, can you do motion 6D for us and get us started on these three? Sure, Madam Chair, it would be my honor. Uh, move that the Weathersfield uh, Board of Education approve digital textbook adoption, looking at the movies, an introduction to film, uh, published by Barsom and Monahan, fifth edition. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion? Uh, real quick, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. uh, this is a new program, a new course we're offering. Um, we looked at the uh, book and the accompanying digital component. I think it's a pretty uh, comprehensive um, presentation of the history of film and all its aspects. It's a good way to start. It's, it's uh, not cheap, of course, but uh, it's a good manual and a good uh, resource book. I think uh, the students will enjoy it. Okay. That's it. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6D passes. Chris, would you read motion 6E for us? Yes, Madam Chair. Move that the Weathersfield Board of Education approve Weathersfield High School curriculum film as literature. And can I have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion on this? A lot of this was done through student program and services, and a lot of discussion was had then, so that's why you may think we're just flying through this. It was fascinating. Uh, again, uh, looked like a very uh, well thought out choice by the staff. Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6E passes. And Chris, motion 6F. Now you're tiring me out, Madam Chair. I know. <laughs> Keep going. You can Move that the right. Weathersfield Board of Education approve Weathersfield High School curriculum myths and legends. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion on this? Uh, uh, yeah, just like the last two, uh, and you'll see the attachment uh, of great detail uh, of these, all three of these, but the last one I think is, a, again, uh, a useful tool. Uh, for the students and a good resource. Fascinating English subjects. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? So motion 6F passes. So we have motion 6G, and I guess we're going up to the podium. Uh, yeah, if I could find it first. <laughs> Okay, motion 6G, we move that the Weathersfield Board of Education approve the Weathersfield Public Schools Mission and Vision Statement and Strategic Plan 2018 to 2024. Second. Is there a second? Thank you, okay, we are gonna go up for a discussion, we'll be up there.
So our Board of Ed and the administration has been working for about a year and a half to create our vision and mission statement and a strategic plan for our schools for the years 2018 to 2024. And what is a strategic plan? Well, a strategic, strategic planning is the process of setting goals, deciding on actions to achieve those goals, and mobilizing the resources needed to take those actions. So tonight's presentation and the recommended motion is on the final plan created by the board administration in committee and at our retreats. A draft of the plan went out to all teachers and staff and to the public for their input. So we now have our roadmap for our learners, teachers, and administrators as we move our system forward. We purposefully made our work a skinny plan, one that has only three goals and the strategies and actions to implement each goal. We did not want a wordy, cumbersome plan that people would simply put on a shelf. So this is to be a living, working document. Michael? So let's talk a little bit about how we educate. Our vision and mission talks about what we should do with our students in order to make them well-rounded citizens. How should we prepare them for the success in the careers that don't yet exist with skills that have yet to even be defined? In 2013, the Depart US Department of Labor noted that 65% of today's school children will eventually be employed in jobs that have yet to even be created. We also think it's just important to find out what our students want to know and do. And just this evening, the curriculum that you approved at Weathersfield High School, that curriculum was developed not only with teachers and our uh, liaison, but input from students, and we think that's important. In terms of what kind of learners do we wish to create, we obviously wish to create curious, creative, and confident learners. Learners that are masters at teamwork. They excel at tapping into the uh, financial material and human resources outside the walls of the schools to help them achieve what they want. And why do we approach education the way we do? The primary focus on pure academics as the only measure of student progress and potential no longer serves our students. We've talked about that. It's not just about test scores. It's about so much more. We need to cultivate and value their social and emotional character their civic awareness and responsibilities, and their demonstration of 21st century skills such as problem solving and critical thinking. Okay, and our center circle there is that the stakeholders or the core values that we're all after as a community, and that's inclusion, commitment to being a lifelong learner, use of knowledge and skills beyond the walls of the school, and personalized learning. So we have our students, we want them to be curious, emotionally, emotional, intelligent, and independent. The Board of Ed and the community partners are to be engaged, uh, mentoring, and resourceful. And our educators, our teachers and staff are to be innovative, tenacious, and catalyst. And family partners are connected, collaborative, and constructive. So we all have our jobs in this. As Bobby had mentioned, this has been over a year and a half that we as the Board of Education and Administration have been working on this. Might I say also the students at Weathersfield High School also had their hand in it with uh, helping us with uh, various videos that we tried to get out to the public. So I also want to recognize that. But under the strategic uh, plan for 2018-2024, we have strategic plan goals, which one is the first one is student achievement. And those guidelines you can find on our website as well as the civic and family engagement, as well as the management, operations, and finance. Each one of these goals have a strategy, and uh, we are really uh, excited about all of them, and uh, we invite the community to look at the website and check them out. We can certainly go through them, but be here all night. But just keep in mind, uh, one of the things that we did discuss it came up at our planning meeting, that this is logical. It's time to do this. 
it's time to move forward uh, with a strategic plan for Weathersfield and that we have a model that we can look at and continue to review. So I'm going to highlight goal number one, which is student achievement. On the screen, you see the strategy related to this large goal. A couple key words I want to highlight are the idea of continuously, continuously improving our practice. Continuum of increasingly challenging opportunities. We want to provide different opportunities for different types of learners with different passions. Uh, academic success, we, uh, within this plan, we have a greater measurement, a broader definition of academic success or student achievement. Um, so student achievement will include the academic success, but we also want to highlight more and work more on social emotional intelligence, the collaborative problem solving, uh, civic awareness and contributions and critical thinking. So I want to highlight just a couple uh, actions within this robust goal of student achievement and talk to you and highlight again a few more words. Uh, action 2.1 is provide professional development and embedded coaching to support educators and all staff in instructing, modeling, and assessing of important skills. So there's an emphasis in the shift towards interpersonal skills such as listening, collaborating, appreciating diversity, and building those relationships so important. Uh, for lifelong learning. 21st century skills such as innovation, how do we teach critical thinking, how do we teach grit and perseverance. Social emotional intelligence such as self-awareness, how do we help students become better self-management, social awareness, relation, building relationships, problem solving, and that responsible decision making that we saw today in some of our presentations. Citizens, citizenship skills. How do we teach our students for, about civil discourse, integrative thinking, to be reflective thinkers, and empathy for others, along with the world of di digital citizenship, such as their self-image, safety, information literacy, relationships, digital relationships, what does that look like? Digital communication, creative credit, copywriting, and cyberbullying. We also want to look at broader measures of the uh, student achievement. So when we talk about developing and uh, furthering uh, students' knowledge of these different skills, how do we measure and share out with parents in the broader community success of a broader measure of achievement? So that is one, uh, two measurements, uh, actually two ideas within this larger goal of student achievement. Uh, the second goal. I'd like to take a moment to talk about civic and family engagement. Certainly what you saw this evening during staff student recognition was an exact example of that civic and family engagement. It's making the walls of the schools more permeable and providing opportunities for students to learn outside and community members to learn inside. Um, one of the things we're fortunate to be engaged in now at this point in time is the Academy Advisory Committee. Um, that's a joint effort between Board of Education and Town Council to engage members of the business community and the Weathersfield community at large in our schools, supporting our students through lunch and learns, uh, um, job shadowing, um, and uh, the potential of job fairs. And even at the elementary level, for example, at um, Emerson Williams, they recently held a career fair, giving students an opportunity to, um, to hone their skills and to develop an interest in the future. The use of social media and small group learning opportunities for family and community uh, topics such as sharing our vision and mission, how to support learning at home, social emotional learning and mental health topics for our students and our families. That digital citizenship piece comes up again and again. Partnering with town and community organizations, whether it be the Weathersfield Chamber of Commerce or our local businesses our Parks and Recreation Department, our Youth Services Department, and our continued strong partnership with the Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative, YMCA, the Keene Foundation, and the Hunger Action Team as well. All of these connections help build a stronger district. And then goal number three focuses on management operations and finance. We're looking to continually evaluate, and again, Sally mentioned before the word continuous, we're seeing continually again, continuous. to evaluate ongoing expenses relative to their ability to promote student achievement, and ensuring a safe and supportive physical environment that promotes effective teaching and learning. We find these to be extremely important. 
We're looking for the opportunity to secure funding sources that make the district less dependent on local taxes. It's about that innovation. It's about the creation of the Weathersfield uh, uh, Foundation, which is absolutely huge. It's about thinking outside of the box, working collaboratively with other districts as well. Again, I think the important piece with this document, too, is that we gather and assess input from staff, from students, from parents. We gather and assess input from community stakeholders as well. And this is the type of plan, as Mrs. Granado mentioned earlier, although it's a skinny plan, it's a plan that's robust. It's a plan that is based on Weathersfield. And it's interesting, when you go back uh, about a year and a half when we first engaged in this work, we were looking at a lot of other districts. You know, what did this district do? What did this district do? And rather than culling from other districts, we developed this from our own hard work, from the input from uh, families and the community members through a survey, input from staff members, from teachers to paraprofessionals, administrators, um, custodians, nurses, uh, lunch aides across the board, getting input and feedback about what was important about this particular plan. All right, so it's wonderful that we work so hard on this strategic plan and committee and at our retreats. And the question came up at the last retreat we were working on, so who's going to manage this? Because it really does need to be constantly reviewed and constantly managed to make sure that the strategic plan is being put to use. So we do have a, a plan management. John and I are taking it on at first with a committee that we hope to form. So this will ensure ongoing review, development, and measurement of the plan's goals, strategies, and actions. So John, I'll let you finish that. Under the uh, action is we are going to create a governance committee to set procedures, monitor implementation, and measure progress of the plan. It's very important that we measure what is working and what isn't working so we can go back and review and make sure it's feasible and not have a plan that just says, okay, that didn't work. So we are looking for measurement and progress. Uh, prioritize all strategies and actions relative to budget and impact. Conduct quarterly reviews to measure progress and recommend adjustments. Communicate goals and ongoing progress with district and community stakeholders and provide opportunities for discussion. We're going to gather and assess input from staff, students, and parents. It's very important that that element be part of what we are doing in our strategic plan. And gather and assess input from community stakeholders. So as you can see, this is just not a plan that we're going to put on a shelf. We are excited. As I mentioned before, uh, it, it's, got a le it's got legs, and we're going to move it, and we're going to continue to work on it. The Board of Education is committed to it. Uh, the administration is committed to it. Uh, once the board approves this, uh, it is on to the administration to take command, but also the governor's committee will be able to uh, monitor and make sure that it's moving in the right direction. Um, we're going to have a lot of bumps in the road, but I think it's a great way to begin, and we're excited as a board. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, do we have any discussion on this motion? Elaine? Um, the last slide is not in our the last slide is not in our packet where you just you say you're gonna form a governance. This one? Yes. I don't think I know. I think it's in the lower box on the last page. Oh, I, on page goal last. three. You look at the bottom, it'll have plan management down there. It's in a uh, on the computer? Chris? No, on the, oh, on the paper. Oh, I I'm printed looking, that off the I'm, computer. You didn't get that? I, yeah, because it is goal three. See down in the squared part? Oh, right okay. Wait, wait a minute. I see. Page five. Okay. I got to go back. Oh, yes, I see it. Okay. That's what I was looking for. I didn't see it as part of that. Okay. That's all I needed. All right. Any other discussion on this? Chris? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Well, let me start by saying that uh, I certainly appreciate the um, time and and toil that was put into this. Uh, I've been reading it for about a week and marking it up as I, I tend to do and, and trying to look at 
not uh, fly spec the whole thing because I don't think that's necessarily important. But uh, when I look at this and read it, a couple of things jump out at me. Um, first of all, if this is a mission statement strategic plan, uh, I think it's important that every stakeholder, parents, teachers, teachers, administrators, taxpayers, whoever, the whole community, uh, would be able to read it, uh, at least read the first few paragraphs, and ascertain a, you know, a real general feeling of what we're trying to accomplish here, long-term, short-term, for the betterment of the school district, for the children. Uh, and I've, um, at least in the first couple of sections, I've got uh, a few questions, but I also have a couple of um, concerns about it, which I'm, I feel pretty strongly about, knowing that I have not participated in this as long as everyone else, and nobody likes to have someone come at the end after all this work and say, uh, you know, this is no good or that is no good. But I do think uh, we are selling ourselves short on this plan, and I think it needs a little bit more crafting. I find it to be overall uh, a lot of buzzwords uh, that only educational professionals understand. Um, I find a lot of it redundant. I find a lot of these, uh, a lot of the phrasing, so in some cases, uh, it just doesn't grammatically run, but I'll, I'll pass on that. But there are, there are code words in here that I don't think have any place in this statement. Uh, and I'll go through them occasionally, and I have some questions in general about the, some of these words. Uh, and I'll go through them real quickly. First of all, um, I don't know if it's what 21st century problem solving means, um, as opposed to 20th century problem solving. Uh, is, that's, a, that's a topic that an average person would say, well, when did 21st century problem solving become the norm, and what does that mean? Does that mean putting kids together? Does it mean uh, you know, going through a whole sort of rigorous uh, uh, aptitude of, of uh, skills and trying to come to a, a group uh, ending where everyone feels they participated, whatever. But the one here that really uh, sort of gets me going here is uh, under action one, engaging in debating and improving social justice issues in the local community and globally. Now, first of all, that's grammatically awkward. But social justice, according to Webster's, means distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. And there's no question what social justice is. It's a buzzword. It's a buzzword that has a political connotation to it. Um, you know, it, my way of thinking is, um, you know, opportunities are pursued, privileges are earned, wealth is earned. And here we have the distribution of it. That is what we will be teaching or we will somehow be asking our children to engage in on the local community and global level. I mean, does that mean we're going to march on Washington every week? Does it mean we're going to petition The Hague? I don't know, but it, to me, I don't understand how that is a goal, a, a strategic plan for our children. Now, everything else in here, I think, is pretty good. It's, it's you know, there's obviously words here that I, and phrasing like high leverage strategies, I'm not particularly familiar with, but letting those go by. Uh, you know, I get into other areas here where I don't know if that's the place of a school district. For one thing, uh, just a couple, that we are going to teach empathy. We're going to instruct people on how to have grit and perseverance. I mean, these are not, and they, we categorize grit and perseverance as some sort of 21st century behavior. I mean, that's what it says. And words are important here. I mean, if, if we're going to put, you know, put this like Martin Luther on the wall and say this is what we're going to strive for every day. It has to be, I think, understandable, usable, clear, unambiguous, less repetitive, uh, and leaves up to the teachers and educators to accomplish those goals as they report back to us as they usually do. Uh, so I'm, you know, really worried about a lot of this. Uh, the way it's crafted, the way it's categorized, the way it's prioritized. Um, and I think a lot of this language does not include the parents as real co-collaborators uh, here. There's no, the, the word accountability, I can't find it much in these documents. Are we going to hold all of us accountable for the education of our children? 
We bring parents in as the goal to further educate them about all these social norms and issues about digital media. I think all that is great, but we need to strike a tone that says, you know, we are accountable as Board of Education members, as teachers, as parents, as students to make the best and most of each opportunity. I don't see that in here. Now, maybe we don't have to say that. Maybe that's, an, that's a given. But we've set forth a lot of visionary ideas about how to develop a 21st century mind. Uh, and yet we don't seem to say that uh, we want to demand a level of accountability. And finally, as someone who sits on three or four committees, I'm also a little worried about this internal committee to monitor the progress of the plan. And it's not because I don't trust the people that want to do it. If they want to have another meeting, uh, that's, that's perfectly all right. But I think that's what the Board of Ed was elected to do in whole, is to measure the progress of, of, each, of each year, but also the strategic goals. And to wall that off with a separate group, although I know you bring it to the board for recommendations like we do other areas here, it would seem to me that could be a conflict, not a conflict, but create more manageable problems. So when does the strategic plan conflict with the day-to-day -day plan? When do, we, when do our priorities change with regard to funding from the state or uh, just the usual challenges that this board, this school system encounters every day? and the conflict it could have with meeting these strategic goals. And if we have sort of two circling globes here, the day-to-day -day workings of the school system and the strategic planning goals, are they gonna always, you know, sometimes when they're not in sync, where do we draw the, where do we prioritize that? Do we say, well, it's a nice goal, we still have to get through the year, we still have to meet these things, we have to get to the practical application of our charge. Uh, and I guess my final uh, question is, wh where, uh, uh, with the last strategic plan we had, which obviously I don't have, and I'm not saying I was, should have been provided it or anything, but what did we come up short on that, and why? Did this plan uh, include that analysis? Did we, you know, in the last, what, five or six year plan we had, did, did we not fulfill some of the goals we set down there? And are they problematic? Are we carrying those over? Did we decide that those were realistic or unattainable? Um, I think that just for my own identification, I'd be interested in you know, some outcomes there. Um, I think this is great that we're doing it. I, I'm, I'm all in on making it happen. My, my, I'm just saying that reviewing this um, and talking to a few people uh, about it, you know, un as they say, disinterested parties. I just come to the conclusion that some of this needs to be at least, at least tightened and some of the issues I've raised about the phraseology and the, and the language that we're using, as well as some of the assumptions we're making about what's the responsibility of a school district, what's the responsibility of a parent and the student. And I see a lot of opportunity here but I see a lot of other open-ended questions uh, that if I think uh, any an every, everyday citizens of this town, <clears throat> excuse me, this town would look at this and say, what is this all about? What, what are they trying to do here? And I, I would challenge any board member to, that if they would read this, who obviously has a level of understanding of the technology and the word speak of education, to say, yeah, I, I could see how someone may not follow this. It needs to be, I think, a little simpler and a little bit more focused and a little less redundant um, because there is a lot of good in here. But those are my, uh, those are my comments. And I thank you again for your time. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Any other comments? Diane? I, um, I have a, a question about the government's governance committee. I, I've been reading it all along that we as the Board of Ed were the governance committee, but I kind of get the impression tonight that that's not the case. Are you asking me yeah, quite? Yeah. It, it is, and what we will be doing is John and I will lead it, and we will be looking for the validation that this plan is being put into use. And also, there will be um, presentations in front of the board that say this plan is being used and utilized. Um, we are just kind of, just like as we put it together, we're also going to watch it as it unfolds and bring it to us. Okay, 
at one of the first meetings we had, I brought up measures. Mm -hmm. Um, so are we as a board the next fit? Cause you can't have a strategic plan, plan unless you have measures, measures for success. Um, so are, is the plan for us to meet after this to develop the measures so we can, we can say that, you know, goal one, this is the measure, mm -hmm. you know, sc test scores or, or those types of things, because there's no way to gauge success without stated measure so is the plan for us to have another meeting where yes we, we establish all the measures yes and those measures will then be incorporated into the plan right and that's what we'll be doing at a retreat or at a committee meeting is we do need to come up with the measures that will assess if the plan is being utilized and john just said it and some things well it's not working so why are they not working and others are working and that that's what we would like to stick with i just I, and i want to just make a point here and and i will say i i'm not worried i know i heard chris's words there is something that i saw for 40 years as i taught and it's a, it's a language that goes on in any profession and this is full of educational language and that is not to be confusing at all and to those of us in education it isn't um, there is there are words like 21st century learning it's different than 20th century learning we're not memorizing like we once upon a time did what we're doing is we're doing critical thinking now critical thinking is problem solving Problem solving also asks for a collaborative problem solving, where once upon a time you sat in your chair, in your desk, by yourself, and that was how you problem solved. So things have changed. I'm just giving you a, a quick um, little incident there of what would be. I do find it inclusive when we're asking family partners to be connected, to be collaborative, and to be constructive. I do find all the pieces here, will they all work? That's why we need to be evaluating this plan constantly, which we put in four times a year, but it will be on a more constant basis. But Chris, I understand where you're coming from. I do think a lot of this, I'm sure if you gave me some of the government motions that you have in legislature, I wouldn't understand them. This does take some time to look at and understand. And um, I disagree with you, I find it very simple um, as we did this, we also heard of other communities who were doing it, and I do know there was one that had like 118 um, goals. We got it down to three, because I do think uh, the simplicity of it is very important. Uh, if I could just respond for the second sure. time. Um, to, to Diane's point, if we do not have measurements built into this, and we approve it, um, don't you think it would be better if we completed the measurement scheme to be, so that it's all in one document at one time rather than approve it and then add on afterwards? I mean, it seemed to me that this is a, if this is a governing document or a guidance document, I should say it's not a governing, a guidance document, um, would it not make it a stronger document if we were to, at least in some general sense, explain to people how we are going to measure our progress or lack thereof based on this plan. Well, I think yeah. one of the things, um, Chris, is when we discuss the measurement, we also, this is going to focus in on the district goals as well as the superintendent's goals. So they're all going to combine themselves and work together. Um, and the board will approve the plan. And, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that you were able to read it. Um, and give us your opinion um, on you know the 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 plan, but this isn't something that just came before us at this meeting. No, I understand that. Yeah. And, and so that was the first thing. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't get around the fact, in my opinion, that this thing is um, it has a lot of loaded words in it that have a political connotation and social justice is the most glaring but there are other things in here that i don't you know it's this is my opinion i'm not trying to hold anything up um where <laughs> i just don't think it's the goal of a of a school district to start to teach children empathy 
that's up to the parents to teach empathy. And if it's part of a culture where we're all sitting around trying to learn social, uh, emotional skills, that's fine. If that comes, if that's part of it, that's fine. But we spell out certain things in here which I think are way over the, the, the line in terms of what we're here to do, which is, I agree with the chair, create, promote creative thinking, uh, problem solving, however you want to term it, make, you know, encourage children to be curious, to be able to be self-aware, to be able to, ha to be able to communicate with not only their peers, but their superiors when they leave here, so that they can have, you know, interaction with all sorts of uh, people from all ages and all backgrounds. I think that's all good stuff. I just get a little nervous when I see these specific little things here that are talking about grit and perseverance and all these other, and I just, I just don't think it's necessary. Well, see, the other thing is when we did review this and look at it and discussed it over several times, the family structure is very different now. It is uh, an issue where some kids go home and there's no parental support um, within the family structure. And that, you know, the word choices were to encompass um, a lot of what we're looking at in today's district. Keep in mind, this isn't just something that the board has put together. The faculty, parents, administration, and board members reviewed this. So everyone was pretty much given an opportunity to bring it to the table. So I, I think that... Um, I appreciate that, but here's the deal. We're elected to be on the Board of Education. We can get input from everybody, but it's ultimately our decision to provide guidance, structure, accountability to this school system. That's ultimately at the pyramid. We're at the top of it because the public elected us to represent their interests here. And I appreciate com collaborative thinking, but sometimes, you know, you, you do things by committee and you get nothing. At some point, someone has to say, okay, we got all your opinions, but we are the elected people here. What do we think is, what do, I'd like to know what these, what all of us think, not just about this, is what is the number one priority that we should be striving for? We've had meetings last night about our challenges about building schools and renovating school structures. That's a huge responsibility. That is definitely gonna go through six years. Uh, and I know we make reference to uh, some of that here, but my point is, and I'll, I will stop, I promise not to belabor this. Okay. But uh, I feel strongly about words are important, structure is important, all that, but uh, you know, again, this is for the public as much as it is for the professional uh, education class, and I don't think it would kill us to write something that is a little bit more understandable and coherent uh, than a lot of these um, terminology, but more importantly, where are we going? And, and I just, and I'm going to vote against this if this goes through at this level, because some of this language I think is just not appropriate and not uh, productive and will not add really any value to our long-term goals. And I just want to stop with that. Okay, okay. anyway, John? And in, 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 I'll go back to the, the family structure and what the students are looking at right now. A lot of what we see is social media. So the, the fact that we're trying to get a student to uh, remove themselves from a, a cell phone and become a little bit more engaged with empathy and understanding with today's society, is that that came out in discussion. Um, so I think that sometimes some students need that. They need to be taught that. And it may not be from their parent. So I, it's not as if we're going to, that's what we're going to stand in front of a classroom and teach that. Through our lessons, we're going to try to promote that. And in, in whether it's before school, after school, or during school. That's the first thing. The other thing, you know, I just, and I respect what you're saying, but I'm just disappointed that you're saying it tonight and that we had other opportunities to discuss this because Not I... Not really. It was supposed to be read twice, and uh, I was assuming that this is the action time where we're going to present it, and we asked for comments, and I'm making my comments. So don't say it's not appropriate. I'm not saying it's appropriate. They are. Chris, we've, been, have, we've had copies of this before us. It, did you reach out to Bobby and tell her your concerns? If, uh, if the chair asks for comments, I'm entitled to make my comments, right? Mm -hmm. can I, Diane? Um, I, I can see the points that Chris is making, and th 
looking at it through his eyes again, I can see um, his. I can see his concerns. The the question I have too is with the measures. But are we also going to be developing strategies? That, for instance, and you know, and I do strategic planning as part of my job. In fact, that's what I was doing today. And under each goal, there are action steps and there are strategies. Now these have an act. These have action steps. But are we going to be doing specific strategies? Like we are going to establish a committee consisting of blah 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 and they are going to give us a study of the graduation requirements. That's drilling down as part of, so each year, are we going to develop the key strategies for the strategic plan? Because I was under the impression that we were going to be doing that in concert with this. First, first of all, we're not going to. That's the job of the administration and the teachers. The, the, the plan is owned by the board, which we have given to the administration if we vote it. And by the way, it's a road map. That's what we're trying to create with our strategic plan. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're saying this is the direction we want the Wethersfield Public Schools to go. If it works, Great, we keep that going. If we're having issues with some of these strategies, with some of the actions, and it is set up that way. It's goals, it's strategies, and then there's actions. We will be measuring them as we move along, and we will be accumulating information as this goes along to see if these are being achieved. I just want to make one mention that we talked about grit and perseverance. We just passed a social and emotional curriculum about, what, four weeks ago, in which we are teaching our children character traits that we want them to show. And we're doing it by example, and we're also doing it through role playing, we're doing it through literature. So we are teaching our children these things. Um, we just passed it. We just passed the curriculum for so, it. So is the plan that each year the administration will give us a list of the specific strat because people get confused between strategies, goals, and objectives and so forth. And you know, that word strategy in my vernacular is an objective or a goal. It, to me, a yeah. strategy is um, I'm doing? trying to see an example here. Um, it, well, you know, it, research and implement alternative ways for teachers, students, and schools to provide broader learner profiles. The strategy is how are we going to do that? So I was under the impression that we were, once we had this roadmap, if you will, we as a board were going to develop each year specific strategies and measures for the success, or the administration was going to present them to us. No, it's all there. It, it, there's a strategy for a goal. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, I, it, it, it's okay. Go ahead. It, these are very broad statements. It's not really an action. Continue to improve social emotional learning opportunities. For, how are we going to do that? That's the strategy. Who are the stakeholders? Who are who's owning that? Who's championing that that goal? Are we going to? Um, Continue, let me do this one. Continue to improve learning in mathematics and reading. So how are we going to do that? Are we going to enhance and provide, change curriculum, those types of things? These are very, these are really high level. I'm talking about with strategic planning, there is a part of it where you're really getting into the weeds. So I was under the impression that once we had this foundation, the board was going to get into the weeds as far as how, how do we go from A to B? I, and I never thought it was the board's job. The, the administration and the staff, that's their job, is to get into the weeds. So are they going to present to us each year mm -hmm. um, that this is what we're going to be doing for the strategic plan this year? Because obviously we're not going to be able to do all of these in one year. Right. It's we're ongoing, not, too. It's yes, ongoing, each, and it's four times no, no, a no. year. But each, each time is the board going to present to us these are... Um, and I'm talking my vernacular, 
these are the strategies we're going to do. This is the champion of that. Like we're going to do something with curriculum about in, about math or something. And Sally is going to be the uh, the champion of the chair of that. And it's going to involve you know the head of the math department at the high school. Da, da, da. And this is what we're going to look at the curriculum. Those types of things. Are we are we going to get that each each quarter or each year or whatever? Or before. It, it will be coming to us. If we have these goals, this is our way of saying, does this match up to what we're trying to do? So when we get a curriculum change, we say to ourselves as a board, is this matching up to our strategic plan? Is this matching up to where we want to go? The senior English classes, classes are a perfect example of this. We want these children to be um, tech savvy, we want them to have, be critical thinkers, we want them to collaborate. Those are perfect examples of a 21st century learner. So when we have that in front of us, we say yes, because it follows the strategic plan. If it's not, then we're not going that route. And budget might keep us from going that route too. We have to think of that. But, but following along with what you just said, that would be a strategy under one of these that you were go you're going to look at the English curriculum at the high school addressing issues X, Y, Z type of thing and um, you know, so one of the teachers at the high school is going to be the champion of that. So we know, because that's how we're going to be able to develop the measure. So that, that's what I was wondering if there's a second phase, phase of this. That, I mean, that's what I'm used to as far as you know, municipal and state strategic planning. So you're talking about the maintenance phase? Well, no, because it's not really maintenance. It's you're you're providing direct. I mean, this is direction, but then you're you're getting specific, and you have to get into the weeds as to you know what some of the expectations are and who's going to do what. That's my line. Yeah. And what, but I don't want to get into the weeds. I don't think that's our job. You said it too, Chris. We're at the top looking down and this is where we say this is what we're after this is what we want the system to be like you implement it that's our job i i don't i don't want to go around saying you know what tests are you doing to make sure these kids are understanding film i don't want to no, do that I'm not, I'm not saying that deep into the weeds but i'm saying typically in a strategic plan there are tasks mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll call them tasks for lack of a better word that says to achieve this goal or this strategy, we're going to do A, B, and C. And it might be revamping the curriculum of the English department, or it might be, you know, looking exactly. at the math curriculum, those types of things. So I'm just wondering where that's going to come in. Is that something that's going to be presented to us each year as part of the superintendent's goals? Or is this governance committee, we as the board, are we going to be provided with that documentation that's that's all I'm saying and that should all come under the idea of that there's a committee that will be maintaining what's going on in this strategic plan mm -hmm. madam chair anyone else ginger I just um, I think people are looking at this a little backwards this is a framework for us and every single thing that comes before us six a b c d a a a b c d this is the framework we're going to use to make those decisions, to vote yay or nay on everything that comes before us. So that's what we should be thinking. We should say, OK, they've asked me tonight whether or not I should vote yay or nay on myths and legends. Does that tie into our strategic plan? By gosh, it does. I'm voting yes. That's the way you should be looking at this. Mm -hmm. You should be looking at it as a roadmap for us, the big thinkers, the top of the pyramid. Heaven help us if I'm at the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. But that's the way we should be thinking about it. I agree. Well, that would be fine if I might, but there's a lot of things in here that you could trip over using that approach unless this thing was, as, as my colleague here talked about, the measuring part of it. Uh, and I think if we included the measuring part of it. Before we vote on it, that would be more complete and I would give a sense of confidence. But putting that aside, I had one question that I don't know if anyone can answer, some of the longer term members. Was any analysis done before we got into this process of the previous 
goals and strategic uh, vision. And I wanted what to mention it. Yeah, we didn't have one. This is our first? This is our first. Okay, well, congratulations. I mean, I'm saying I'm not trying to be funny here. I just, because that was my thought. You know, usually when you go from mm -hmm. one to the other, you evaluate. And I think it's so important that we have some sort of a plan, whether it's you think it's a little too broad or too specific, but a plan that we will constantly be evaluating. Are we on the right track? Are they on the right track? They being the administration and the staff. Um, I agree, we're at the top of the pyramid and we should be directing what's going on and I find this is our roadmap for the directions. Thank you for uh, entertaining oh. so much talking on my part. Oh, no, Chris, no problem. Oh, it, it adds yeah. elimination. I'm, I'm absolutely fine with it. Um, I think a lot of the things you're pointing out, we're probably doing already. We're already teaching empathy to kids because we've got to teach them how to work together for various projects. We have to deal with bullying issues. We all got a letter at the end of last week regarding a possible bullying incident. I guess we'll hear more about somebody. That, that's what happens anyway. We are teaching the grid issues anyway, the perseverance, because we're teaching kids how to work through things they don't know or may want to just give up on because it's too hard, and we press them to do that. That's, that's kind of what we're talking about. I, I'm not even worried about the, the goals and the strategies part, the, the, the nitty-gritty and the weeds, because the end of this plan, as it points out, I think Chris pointed out that the page of it says that this governance committee will set those procedures and measure the progress and set those kinds of things up. And I think we've considered that part of it. I, I tend to agree with, with Ginger that we, we should stay up here on the top of the food chain and not go down into the weeds, whether it's high in the weed or low in the weed. There's, there's a reason why we hire highly skilled staff people, teachers, and administrators to do this stuff. And, we hire them because we trust them to, to work these things out and be able to deal with those kids and deal with those things. And I'm very comfortable with doing that. I don't have a problem with the plan as it is. I'm sure it's gonna be improved and revised and refined over time, as it should be. And I think this is a good first step. Um, I really like the, the notion of skinny yet robust. It made me think about a Lattice more set song, but that's for another day. <laughs> Anyone else for comments? Okay, we I, had a sec, oh, Elaine. Um, I was the person who said at the end of the workshop um, or the statement, who's going to be responsible for what? And um, I agree with um, that all nine of us should be involved in whether this is working or not. Um, I don't think there, and, and I, I just got the impression tonight that there'd be a small group and then reporting back to all of us. I think it's in a plan that's so big, so wordy, that um, it may be difficult for public to read, but I would like to see um, all of us be a part of the plan management. I have been on the board and I have, Polly and I, and if I could find it in my boxes of stuff at home, there was a whole slew of goals that never got looked at, that got sat on a shelf um, and Polly and I got it our first year on. And, and it, I don't know if it was a strategic plan or goals for over the years, but it went for a good all the years that I was on. So I just think that we need to um, be careful here on, on um, the management part. I want to be, I think we all should be part of that part piece. And I also agree with Diane in this section that we should have the measurements on here of how we're going to measure these because there are some very vaguely worded um, actions, you know, um, and, and if we don't, how are we going to say, well, we did that if, you know, if we don't have the, the specific wording of the measurement. I would, you know, and, the, and, and you, and anything we do with the, the teachers when they get evaluated has a measurement on it, so I, it just seems to me that we should have a measurement on it, but I, I mean, uh, it's not, it's not, something I would vote against, Bobby. It's just that I think it needs some fixing up in some parts. Anyone else for discussion? Okay, so we'll vote all in favor. Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. No. Any abstentions? Okay, so that was like motion 6G, if I'm correct. Okay. So we'll move on. So we have our first reading of the proposed graduation requirement changes. Sally Destoli and Tom Moore, are you coming up? I thought so.
screen goes up and down all night long, yeah? <laughs> as long as it keeps doing it. <laughs> Hopefully the motor doesn't burn out. It doesn't close anymore. Oh, the camera too. Oh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased that we had such a uh, good part to the first part of the meeting with Highcrest and with the athletic program uh, because, quite honestly, uh, what we are bringing to you uh, this evening uh, is, is actually uh, a little bit disappointing. Uh, before we, we move forward, I would like to uh, acknowledge the uh, members of the Weathersfield High School uh, staff and the district staff who have worked so diligently on uh, both the graduation requirements that we brought forth to the Board of Education in 2015 and now some revisions. So what I'd like them to do is just introduce themselves and uh, what position they play either in the district or at Weathersfield High School. Stephanie McKenna, English teacher and English department liaison. Cynthia Bryan, school counselor and school, co uh, school counselor department liaison. Matt Mangino, Spanish teacher and world language department liaison. Diana DeVivo, assistant principal at the high school. Again, these people have worked diligently uh, with really what is a, a very, very difficult task and that is really a, a task of economics and that is trying to figure out how we might be able to uh, continue the work of 2015 in which we increased the graduation requirements from 22.5 to 25.0. Now, originally, the intent of our committee was to be ahead of state legislation. The State Department uh, of Education really had um, pushed forward right, the idea that all high schools in the state of Connecticut were going to be moving towards a 25.0 uh, credit level. Right? So again, uh, with the help of the Board of Education and uh, specifically with the help uh, of uh, Elaine uh, as our board liaison and a member of the committee, we were able to put together a graduation requirement credit list that really we felt um, supported students at the high school, supported their aspirations as they were looking for post-secondary plans, right? Uh, however, well, we ran into a little bit of an impediment, and that impediment is called money. And with the idea uh, that some of the budgets have uh, really remained stagnant, uh, with the idea that our committee was going to try to grow the program along with some personnel and then combined with the fact that we had an issue in district where uh, we had to absorb some losses, some teachers that were both working at the middle school and the high school eventually migrated to just at the middle school causing a loss of full-time equivalents at the high school. Uh, this really uh, brought us to a circumstance where we had to uh, really look at what our graduation requirements could realistically be. And unfortunately, uh, what we came up with was to move back to the 22.5 level, right? So you can see what our task was and is. So, the committee is recommending that we com uh, continue to have a number of the elements in the work that was done by the 2015 committee. So we are going to have remnants uh, of such, and you'll see it in, in uh, one of the upcoming slides. Uh, we are going to uh, continue to require one credit in world language, which is different than uh, what we had before the work in 2015. Originally, we thought we might have a graduation requirement of two credits in world language, but realistically, we're going to scale that back down to one. Uh, instead of three and a half credits in the career and life skills, we're going to scale it back down to three credits. And for the time being, 
we are going to eliminate the senior demonstration project, uh, which most people know as the capstone project. Not that we don't have value in it, but again, economically and uh, in a fiscally responsible environment, we think that this is a prudent move. So uh, again, right, the committee is uh, recommending that, uh, and I realize this is a first reading that we move from uh, 25.0 to 22.5 uh, credits as the requirement for a diploma from the Wethersfield Public Schools. And this will only impact the classes of 2020 and 2021, our current sophomore and freshman classes. Again, the only classes that would be impacted in terms of moving back from that original requirement. So if uh, you look at policy 5300 in this first reading, it would look like uh, what you see up on the, up on the slide. Uh, we would, again, continue to have the format of nine credits in humanities, right? As you can see, English, social studies, and, uh, and fine arts. Eight credits in STEM, and we want to keep that acronym because we think that it's important as we move forward. Uh, a difference uh, is that we're including four years of mathematics instead of three. Uh, three credits <clears throat> in the career and life skills, uh, one credit in world language, and then there is a 1.5 credit requirement in terms of electives. Right Now, in 2015, we did an awful lot of research uh, into what our neighbors were looking for in terms of credit requirements, graduation re requirements. Um, I can remember our committee, and we met for hours and hours on end, really looking at the course catalogs of almost all our, our neighbors. Right, But just because of this one particular change or recommended change, uh, we did a little bit of research in terms of what uh, some of our neighbors are looking for in terms of credit requirements, and you can see those right there. So some of the towns did not make changes prior to the state mandate. Again, that mandate is being pushed out, right? And again, I don't believe that there really is a time frame for that at this particular point in time. Right, so uh, with that, again, disappointing, a little bit disheartening. Uh, we will do the best that we can in terms of, of what we have. Um, a first reading, so I understand, right, that there will be time to uh, really just, you know, take this in, uh, information and digest it. But if indeed there are questions, Madam Chair, uh, I have some experts with me uh, who can answer in uh, really almost any area. If not, uh, we'll let you digest the information. Okay, thank you. Any questions, Kevin? Uh, Mr. Moore, or Mrs. DeSoli, can you uh, just briefly talk about, um, I guess, the graduating classes and how um, the actual credits they do receive are beyond 22 and, for the most case, beyond 25 already? Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, some of the information is really misleading. I would venture to guess that really we have uh, a smaller percentage, uh, percentage of students who are looking at that 22.5 uh, level. Uh, approximately 80% uh, of our students graduate somewhere in the 24 credit, 25 credit, 26 credit circumstance. So again, what we're trying to do is just make it possible for all students to succeed. Again, this is a floor, certainly not a ceiling. Thank you. Anyone else? Polly? Uh, so just so that I understand on this, the, the, uh, the main reason for this change then is related to the fact that um, while we, is basically a, a financial consideration and it really has more to do with the fact that, uh, and I'm fully aware having been here for all the years that we've been trying to uh, include a la world language teacher for instance, and I also realize about the capstone. So this really boils down to the fact that we have not been able to uh, obtain funding for those additional uh, positions. Am I correct? You are absolutely correct. Okay, so it's not really going to provide us with any savings, as it were, from, from our actual budget. It's not going to reduce any more uh, what, we've al what we've already, uh, I mean, every year those, um, those positions are put in and every year they end up uh, falling by the wayside because of our budgeting. 
that's uh, so that basically is is where your reasoning is coming from we just that is absolutely support. correct and similar to now what is the board of education's budget uh, a maintenance budget a status quo budget uh, we without any increase in staffing do not feel that we would be able to do justice to the 25 credits and so you are exactly correct right on on target it is a staffing issue okay is there um I'm just wondering if this, cre I, I do see where, where other towns are, and even at 22 and a half, we're still above other, uh, most of the other towns. Um, but I'm wondering, is this going to have anything to do with, the, with uh, our rating, with our uh, status, that type of thing, to move backwards like this, other than the fact that it's uh, um, horrendous? <laughs> Well, yeah. I, and I agree with you that it is horrendous. Uh, I believe you're referring to our accreditation yeah, yeah. status, and I believe the NAAC was in the news today, right, with a uh, little bit of their college circumstances with the community colleges. Uh, but our affiliation is with the Commission on Public uh, Secondary Schools. Uh, we will not have a, another uh, go-round in terms of our accreditation for a few more years. Okay. So we will have to explain our yeah. circumstance why these types of things have occurred, uh, but I can't anticipate that there would be any negative effect. Oh, okay. And, um, and at, the other thing oh, I, that I was going to ask you was, from what I understand, uh, students in the middle school, for instance, if they're taking uh, if, world language or certain uh, courses, that if they um, have what, uh, and I'm all of a sudden kind of blacking out on this, but if, if um, they obtain what be your better average okay. uh, then they can get credits during that period that would move on to the high school then yeah. yes currently we have students that are earning uh, credit in world language for taking seventh and eighth grade in okay. world language and starting our world language at the second level so if they took Spanish one over two years at the middle school then they would start in our Spanish two class the second year of that Spanish class okay and as it stands now they would get that credit placed on the transcript we do it during their junior year, so it's on there for colleges, for college purposes. Okay. And the and same thing with math. So if they have finished okay. their Algebra one at the middle school, they can move on to our Algebra two honors course. Okay, and has that school. helped to relieve the, uh, the, situa the staffing? No, because it's no. always been like that. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that, that has not been a change. Uh, I've been there for 20 years now, it hasn't changed, so. <laughs> yeah, we, I was just hoping. Yeah. And the other thing, too, was, and I guess to Mr. Moore on this, um, I, I'm looking at the copy of the, um, the policy uh, 5300 and the wording in that third paragraph um, indicates the beginning in 2016-17 for classes graduating in 2020 and beyond the following credits, are, the 22 and a half credits are required. Um, from what I'm understanding, th th probably not and beyond. You're, you were saying in here that it would really only be 2020 right. and 20. 21. The only classes that have been impacted, as Ms. Bryan can attest, because she helps uh, children schedule uh, their, their classes, currently those students who are sophomores and freshmen were really looking at uh, trying to, by the end of their career, get 25 credits, right. right? If indeed this goes through, that will no longer be the case. Okay, but just for uh, those, as long as the state basically if the Un state until the state the, acts right yeah, and at that yeah. point in time then we will be back to you with you know what whatever recommendation uh, is feasible and plausible okay thank you very much okay Elaine um, miss Bryant I just have a quick question if um, if a child takes uh, the advanced math in um, eighth grade I think it would be um, and that would be algebra one if I recall yes um, do they have to take to get the credit for the high school the algebra one test offered at the high school? Not when they're coming for our middle school. So we'll have students that are taking algebra one at the middle school and we're using the teacher recommendation for them to move on. If they take algebra one at the middle school and they don't move on, then they would start in algebra one with us. Does that make sense? Is that? Yeah, uh, I, okay. I was asked something, I was asked by a parent for this question, you know, my son's taking the eighth grade um, advanced math class. We, um, I think there, there may be a circumstance this year, it's an unusual circumstance where we have a couple of students that are doing something beyond that. 
And so we're asking them to take our Algebra 2 final. Well, I, I, I just did some research and it seems to, to, the way I read it, it was that if you take the high school math class that would be equivalent to the ninth grade algebra class at the high school, but you're taking it in eighth grade, you have to take the test that the ninth graders would take if you look in the... Um, several years ago, our middle school and our high school uh, math teachers worked together, so the middle school does have a... Uh, like a common midterm and final. Yeah, so as it's on. like a high school course yeah. in eighth grade, right. um, they are taking a uh, similar like oh, exam so as a high school. That's fine. Yep. Yeah, that, that'll make them happy. <laughs> Anyone else? Diane? Um, which of these, do any of these towns have the capstone project? I didn't do that specific, uh, Berlin does, but I didn't do the research on the rest of them, so I can't speak to the rest of them. I would like to know, um, if any of these towns have a capstone project. I'm really concerned about that. Um, this is something I thought we, sh we should be having right along. Um, and I'm concerned about the reduction of the life services, life skills, even though it's a point, it's a half a credit. Um, I, I really think, and I know it sounds like we're beating a dead horse, but I really think that we as a board need to study these AP classes. And I know, you know, it makes us, our school look good because we have 25 AP classes or whatever. But last year when I chaired programs and services, we looked and there was either, you know, underutilization, kids not taking tests. Um, and I know there's a lot of reasons why kids don't take, te take the tests. And, but, you know, especially one class where there was 25 kids registered and two kids took the test, something like that. So I think in this resource, lack of resource environment, we need to see are there things that we should be getting out of the business of um, taking, taking a look at these AP classes and determining whether those resources could be put somewhere else. Um, and, you know, going back to the strategic plan that we just discussed, these actions fly in the face of goal one, action seven, action one, action two, goal two, action one, and action two. So you said, you know, when we look at these things, we have to look at this plan now. And I look at this, and it isn't consistent with what our strategic plan is. So I would like to see something where we can we can at least embrace the concept of the capstone and, and work it into some of our curriculums. I think it's very, the, there were very important skills, although when the pilot project was run, I, I wasn't that impressed with it, but those are important skills these kids need for college. Mm -hmm. The project planning, those types of things. And I think we need to make a commitment that if we're not gonna have a capstone project, we're going to make sure that it's the intent and the concept of Capstone is written into some of our other curriculum so these kids are getting it. You know, I'm going to agree, and if you want to talk about the um, strategic plan, I was disappointed when Capstone kind of just left because of all these credits. But um, in our strategic plan, we do have authentic project-based learning, and so that's what it is. But that's what the Capstone That's what the Capstone is. is. That's what I'm saying. So. It doesn't have to be just capstone. I mean, it, we can put it into our curriculum. Teachers can be putting it into curriculum. I know in the elementary grades they were doing that. A play is a, a project-based um, part of curriculum to see if children have done their literacy for that year. Um, so yes, I'm 100% behind the idea that we should be having this um, idea of a capstone, but it doesn't have to be called capstone. I think that's what we kind of got hung on. Uh, can I just ask, how many teachers do we have dedicated to Capstone now, or is it still a, because when we first started, I think it was collaborative. We had two. Okay. Yeah. No, zero. There's zero. no teachers currently. We did a pilot that's year early, but again, it would be the current sophomores that would have been required to take the Capstone. Normally some is a junior, um, many is a senior. Right. So I think you're correct. It, it fits in with the project-based learning. Again, our recommendations from this committee looked back at 2015's uh, report and recommendations to the Board of Ed. Uh, and so the, the request over multiple years at that time 
Um, and I think in 2015, nobody had a crystal ball to look towards the state and uh, financial situation we're in now. Uh, we had requested as, a, as moving this uh, 2015 policy forward, a full-time world language teacher, a full-time capstone, and a part-time would be fine arts or tech ed or life skills. So the reductions in credit really is mirroring the staff that we had done a lot of data analysis around, uh, a lot of investigation, um, and um, so our recommendations forward today are really financial based upon the recommendations of staff that we were not able to add to meet the 25 credits. Um, I, I totally agree, and I know the committee agrees in capstone and project-based learning and it's authentic learning and the essential pieces um, does align with our strategic plan. Um, our strategic plan and our roadmap each year is dependent upon budget, and I think this is one of the uh, hard conversations we have about the financial times uh, that we have faced for the last three years and looking ahead, um, and we have to be realistic and help prepare our students to graduate, and we are being proactive coming forward with a plan that we think is doable based upon the financial situation we're in. Okay. Anyone else, Diane? And through the chair, can we as a board look at other resources? Can we think outside of the box, look at the AP enrollment, um, what the value, what the cost benefit is of some of those AP classes. Another concern I have is moving the science AP um, from one block to two blocks. Can, can we look at the, take a really hard look at them and see is there, are there resources that we can squeeze out of that that we can direct towards the greater good? And, and, and look to see um, what the administration's concepts would be as to how we would go about moving some of that capstone value into the curriculum of our of our other classes, I, I just I feel that's very important, and I think that there are at least two or three AP classes that I think are um, we're not getting the bang for our buck, and in these times we need to get the bang for our buck. So if I could speak to that a little bit. Um, each year we have signups for AP classes and every other class. We have electives we can run, we can't run. On a yearly basis, our decisions built in uh, have to be made at a building level based upon courses that run or don't run. It's also related to what other courses are offered on uh, period two on that day, on an A day, um, and what other options are for students. So if you think about uh, 1,200 students have to be scheduled into these different blocks and schedules and courses and meet these different categories of graduation requirements, um, it's, a, it's a huge feat. Um, so I, I agree, Diane, every year we look at our AP enrollment, um, how many students take our AP, which courses they're gonna run, um, at all courses, all electives, not just at AP, across all courses, um, and looking through the lens of ensuring students meet their graduation requirements first, and then going above and beyond. Um, those are hard decisions every year um, to make, uh, but whether they're gonna take an AP science class or a non-AP science class, they still have to have a science credit and be in a seat. So um, we also have to share our AP profile to colleges and universities, well, and we build and that each year. So there's a balance. I don't think it's, and I don't think you're saying to go one way or the other, but it's a balance that has to be made each and every year, but students still have to earn those credits. So if we didn't offer AP classes, those students would be in a different science class or a different math class or a different English class, still having to earn the same number of credits as far I, as the financial piece. I get that, but what I'm saying is we need to look at these AP classes not just the enrollment, how many kids are taking the test, how many kids are getting fours and fives, because threes don't transfer well into other schools. In fact, when you look at what schools are accepting now, they're accepting fours and fives, except for maybe psychology or English. But the math and the sciences, you gotta get a four or five. And the last time we looked at the scores, we didn't have a lot of kids getting a four and a five. So we did look at those at the last student programs and services meeting, um, and it was on the agenda for that last meeting but also. I mean, we need to look at it from a concept of, is there, are we adding value to the kids, for the kids for their college experience, or do we need to step back and look at the curriculum of that AP, that they're preparing those kids for those exams? So from a parent and professional experience, uh, I think that whether a student takes an exam or not, that course offers a highly, uh, uh, 
enriched and um, high level of expectations like a first year college course that could be very different than other high school courses and it's a learning opportunity for students in a very structured environment where they may have success or may have to struggle along their way. So from a personal point and a parent point, I think there's a great, uh, a great reason to offer those courses. Uh, we as a district do not pay for exams, so there really is up to parents and children to decide if they're gonna take their exam. And there's a lot of different choices that go into that. I would not advocate for every student to have to take the exam. Um, we could only do that if the board was gonna pay that and we're in not financial times to do that. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons. I don't think it's black and white as to why uh, families, students decide to take the exam or not. Um, by all means, can we do better in every curriculum area across every co course? Uh, yes, I think there's that continuous improvement piece of it. Speaking from a personal perspective, my daughter got an almost perfect score on the AP biology exam. She got a five, she got three wrong. When she got to UConn, she could waive bio introduction to biology or whatever the course is. She decided to take it because she was in pre-med. She came home and said, this was nothing like I learned in high school. It was more challenging in college. And I happened to talk to a lot of those kids in that class, and a lot of them took their math and sciences over again because they were concerned that the AP classes they took at Wethersfield High School were not living up to what they needed. They were math majors and they were science majors. And then we have another, and I keep bringing this up, we had one class where you had 25 or 30 kids, and this is in the class of 2016, took an AP class, and only four or five of them took the test. And when I asked them why they didn't take the test, it was because they weren't prepared adequately to take the test. They did not want to take the test to spend the money, and they did not want a low score showing up on their transcripts. So we need to open our minds and take a hard look at these AP classes for the testing and are we doing them justice? Any other questions on the graduation requirement policy that's in front of you for tonight? Anyone else? Well, we did discuss this at Student Program and Services to a great extent, um, and I and I had looked, you know, as much as you can to find information on AP classes, and there were six reasons why you take an AP class in high school, and three of them had nothing to do with the score or a test. It had more to do with the experience of it all. Now, my son, oh God, he's going to hate me after this, um, would not get a five on an AP class, but yet he's a very successful man today. High school is a time to experience, um, and I'm all for a learning time in high school, and there's a price tag on college now that is so expensive that you really do need, whether it's college or career experiences in our high schools. Um, so I do look at AP for those kids who are so smart and so capable, but I also look to AP for those kids who really need to keep growing and need to have an experience of what's expected uh, of me. Of course. Well said. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. We all okay. set with our Thank first so reading. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. I am. Okay, <laughs> meetings held. We had a special board of education meeting, our retreat. Okay, Ginger. You're up. Uh, no? Um, I, Go ahead. No, Give I give it a try. It. No, I'm going to try it. I, I'm okay. sorry, I have a cold, so I'm going to sound a little froggy as I do it. But um, we did have a retreat to go over the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was presented much more ably than I will be able to do tonight. Uh, we um, discussed how we were going to monitor it. And we also got into a discussion uh, through our facilitator about um, some of the trends that he had started to notice in um, amongst our teachers, um, uh, in particular uh, a stress level of trying to balance the 
the art of teaching and the science of um, quantifying how that teaching was working out. Um, that's something that's going to continue to be monitored and they're going to do this through workplace personality inventory surveys at some schools and we will get a report <coughs> back on trends and patterns. Thanks, Ginger. Any questions for Ginger? Okay. We had a, another special Board of Ed meeting on April 3rd. Elaine, would you speak to that? Um, yes, that meeting was about identifying two new classes for the district. One would be at Charles Wright, that would be the STRIVE program, and the other one would be at Webb, and that would be the ABA? No. ABA program. I did say the, it right. And the STRIVE program is going to be at Hamlet. Hamner, I'm sorry, did I say That's that? Okay. No? okay. Um, these two programs were developed um, by teachers and by staff to help um, place our special ed students in the environment within the town, so they will be in con contact with their friends in town, um, and this um, they will be um, specialized and is part of the Board of Ed's strategies and goals. Great. Any questions for Elaine? Thank you. Um, our wellness committee was on April 3rd. Um, Diane? We met and um, we just discussed the use of um, cell phones and other devices in the school. Um, we're going to get some more information from the um, teachers about the use and control of those. And our next meeting is next week and we're going to talk about um, security. Um, I think the director of security is going to be at that meeting. Yes. Um, so we're going to talk about security and um, drills and those types of things. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Diane. And also, School Project Building Committee. Michael? I was unable to attend that uh, particular meeting. It was about 1,300 miles away. Oh, okay. Um, Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative, which is WEC. Uh, we Holly? did the... Um, I, um, the minutes for that April 16th uh, meeting are inclu were included in your packet. I did not attend. Um, however, I did want to um, uh, just, uh, and I think everyone probably received an invitation to this, but the, um, the uh, PEP graduation, and that's a UConn uh, program called For People Empowering People, and it's basically a leadership program for parents. Uh, their graduation is going to be on May 10th. They have 10 graduates this year. And I believe this is the second or third year of it. And the, um, uh, the response has been absolutely great. And uh, so there appear to be some very good parent leaders who are coming out of this. So um, uh, I, I think I'm assuming everyone has gotten that invitation. So uh, if you haven't, let me know. May 10th, yeah, in the community center. Okay, that's thank you, Polly. Student Program and Services, that's come up a lot tonight. John? Uh, I can't add anything to it. We've talked it to death already. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think we spent more time on it here than we did in the meeting. Huh? Okay, they are wonderful, though. It I was do love fun. them. It's fascinating. Um, Crack Council, we're picking on you again there, Polly. Um, okay, again, I um, am gleaning this from the. Um, uh, from the, the uh, um, agenda from last week because unfortunately I wasn't able to go to that either. Um, but one of the thing, there were um, a couple of items on the, um, the agenda. Uh, I, they, uh, there was a lot of discussion as far as uh, their budget is concerned and that the, uh, uh, the concerns that CREC has um, actually about even the future of the, um, of the magnet school system because um, of the fact that you know they're having a very difficult time as far as uh, reimbursement and uh, uh, their issues with the state are are tough. Um, one of the things that they are continuing is they have two um, schools that are that they received um, the okay from, and uh, the state has asked them to go ahead with their grants. Uh, one that they were they approved proof or were set to approve the site work was for the uh, Anna Grace Academy of the Arts Magnet School. Um, and this would be a um, pre-K to eight and would basically 
uh, replace two, uh, there are two schools now. One is uh, PK to five, which is the um, uh, magnet, uh, magnet elementary school. And then there's an arts academy um, middle school, which is six to eight. And the enrollment there combined is 760 kids. This new one would be expected um, that once it was completed, uh, there would be approximately 876 children. So their, their, uh, uh, their need for facilities is growing. The, um, and the cost, on the, the cost on this is roughly $108 million. So, um, and that it does include their soft costs. But, um, you know, that is, that's also a difficult thing for them to uh, break ground on because they have been having a little trouble getting an, a very solid commitment from the state that, um, that the money is actually there. So um, there was, uh, so anyway, that, that is one of their concerns. There also uh, were a number of policies that were, um, that were circulated for approval and um, a lot of them, uh, actually I forwarded the list of them to um, the members of, of our um, policy committee and uh, I expect that we'll review them on, uh, at, our, at Thursday's meeting and um, we'll, uh, we'll see it, you know, how close we are to, um, uh, to matching with those. And uh, pretty much, um, the rest of it. they have had quite a few staff reductions and I know they're trying to work on their I'm bringing that back into line but anyway okay. so thank you any questions for Polly no no <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah. Polly doesn't want any questions <laughs> what they could probably do is cut out giving us lunch all the okay. time but <laughs> yeah you do go ahead just a simple question about Polly, I just want to know on Thursday, is there anything we should read yes. for your, your policy meeting? The meeting is thir not wow. tomorrow's Wednesday, Thursday yeah. is your meeting. Is there anything, you, I, we didn't get an agenda and I didn't know if there's any certain policies you want us to read before we get there. <laughs> Remember how we used to read them when we got there, Mike? I think, what is the agenda? I didn't know what you Yeah, the agenda will go out tomorrow and the agenda actually has the first update from the Shipman and Goodwin policies. We just got an update, so we'll be looking at that. Obviously, some further discussion over policy 5300, which obviously came before you tonight for a first read. Mm -hmm. If there are any additional questions to that, and as no, you I may recall, it's looking to the bylaws. We're also, right. Yeah, exactly. We're also going to be going back to the bylaws. Yeah, bylaws yeah. She wanted so to bring the big book. It's a big book. We need to read it ahead of oh, time. That's all. <laughs> nothing compared to what we've had before. That's all I wanted to know what I should read before. Yeah, it's a lot better yeah, than it was. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> a lot better than it was. I, I, I actually read it. Okay, we all set? All right, John, Memorial Day Parade Committee. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Uh, as all, uh, the parade will be Saturday, May 26th, 9 a.m., line up at the Motor Vehicle Department. Uh, if in rain, we go to the high school auditorium for that particular th uh, event. The theme is recognizing Weathersfield's first responders who have served their country and our community. Um, <clears throat> financial report of the parade is that uh, a grant was received for $500 from the MDC and we received a $100 donation by Unico. So we're underway and we're going. Parade marshals are being selected. The Memorial Day address speaker was chosen. It's in your April 18th minutes in the packet that you have. Mm -hmm. um, the essay contest and elementary display of art, uh, both programs are underway. The essay contest has been completed by the eighth graders at the Silas Dean and the sixth graders uh, will have their project completed and will be delivered to the uh, Parks and Rec Department on May 4th. They will go on display here in the Town Hall Council Chambers as well as within the various offices in the Town Hall. So that's pretty exciting and something new um, and it's uh, something that we used to do the years ago. Uh, uh, so we brought it back. Um, so I think it's gonna be a great event and uh, Anne Memorial, uh, <clears throat> I think we'll be uh, honoring those. So that's Memorial Day update. Great. Well, John, keep talking because you're doing facilities and maintenance, which okay. was just last, last night. night. 
facilities and maintenance uh, committee met and it, I believe it was uh, something that was an eye-opener um, we met with uh, the uh, individuals uh, from Bloom and Mick, no, Malone and Mick Broom, as well as Collier's International Group. Uh, we're looking for ideas, uh, uh, a baseline for Weathersfield Elementary Schools and middle school. Uh, we're including the middle school to find out what exactly our needs are in all, our, all of our buildings. Um, uh, as we all know, currently there are five elementaries and uh, what, our goal is to reach out to uh, the town council and have conversation with them, um, just to let them know what our plan is and where we're, we're hopeful and going. Um, there, it's divided up into four phases, and each phase is unto itself. Within phase one, um, it will look at building enrollment, understanding the actual uh, situation perform a facilities conditions assessment on each of the elementary schools in the Silas Dean Middle School. We're looking at developing a 10-year uh, enrollment projection and conduct capacity and utilization studies of all our existing schools to determine current or future space deficiencies. So I think phase one will help us into the other phases. Um, and those that were present uh, can certainly uh, you know, speak up, but our, uh, the plan and the progress is to, you know, share what we've heard last night with the town council, as well as uh, eventually get a presentation to the full board. Okay, great. Any questions for John? Um, I just have a question for Mike Emmett. Mike Emmett, didn't we have a survey or something done for the enrollment NASDAQ. that went out for, yeah, but we that had, was NASDAQ, I We did, remember. NASDAQ, that NASDAQ. was a NASDAQ enrollment and study. So it showed pretty flat, we were gonna be pretty good. It did, the, and what, what um, they will do is they will take our NASDAQ data oh, and then they will go deeper okay. with it. Um, okay. They'll do a series of algorithms, they'll look at um, the birth rate, so they'll okay. probably tap into the data from WEC. Um, they'll look at what projects um, are going on. They'll also do a density study uh, by neighborhood oh, so okay. that they can look at the, um, the, uh, the concentration of students in yes. particular neighborhoods. And what it does is it provides us with the opportunity to understand where the heavier pockets sure. are and the concentrations of students are. That'll be are. helpful. I, mm -hmm. just, I just remember to seeing a consistent population in that chart that we got. And I thought that's great because yeah, we're not some, seeing, some people correct. like Lassenberry were we're not seeing a significant decrease no, in, in okay, enrollment here in the district. So, and the other idea here with regard to all of this data and this analysis is to, you know, come up with the best possible options. You know, obviously we've talked about the fact that we have dreams about what we'd like to see at Hanmer, what we'd like to see at Highcrest, at Webb, Charles Wright, um, and, you know, and Emerson Williams as well. I <laughs> will not forget Emerson, no way. Um, and the process here of looking at what those best options are. Um, we may find that with our current space standards and what we have, we need to go in a different direction. Uh, we may find that uh, consolidating schools may work. Uh, we may find that a build new may not work and renovate as new may be most appropriate. So there are a lot of options. So what we would do in this process is, um, John had mentioned, it's a phased approach. Um, and John, also talked about the fact that we'd like to talk with members of, of council and leadership on the town side to talk about what our, our plan is. Obviously, as you know, the building committee, the current building committee as it is structured, was charged with both Weathersfield High School, which I'm proud to say is done, uh, and also Hanmer Elementary School. Obviously, at this point in time, we're not ready anywhere close to putting a shovel in the ground, but this is the planning process that lays out the groundwork for the future of our schools. Mm -hmm. Part of what uh, we also have been discussing over the board meetings is the redistricting uh, look. And that's something that we, uh, as a committee, discussed that we would like to see it possibly only once mm -hmm. rather than uh, you know keep doing it every other year. So if that should happen. So within phase one, if we are able to do it, um, that will help us that will get us into the next phases as we move forward. So rather than go into all the phases, I think one at a time. Yep. Any other questions? Any comments? Okay, thank you. 
Um, and then Finance and Information Management Committee, Kevin. Thank you, Madam Chair. We met prior to this meeting tonight. Um, very briefly, uh, looking at this year's financials, the expectation is still that would come in around uh, an accurate budget, so plus or minus zero. Um, we are, we're seeing some savings this year in uh, our substitute line item uh, year over year from last year, as well as paraprofessionals. We may see some savings dependent upon when their recent contract is signed. Um, Moving on to the budget discussions for eight budget years, 18, 19, next year, we recently had our budget workshop with the town council. Uh, we continue, we, um, uh, Mr. Kazaka from our business office is uh, able to answer a lot of their, their, address any of their concerns or questions that they had. And we are in uh, uh, communicating, continue to communicate with them so that we can uh, uh, vote out a budget by May 15th. Um, in, in other business, we discussed possible uh, savings initiatives that we can look at while teaming up with Autumn um, next year. Uh, okay. Further, I'm sorry, one, one last item is that uh, the shared services will be meeting again to discuss any possible savings that we could possibly squeeze out of uh, the uh, new position to replace Mr. Bushy. Okay, any questions for Kevin? Okay, so now meetings um, scheduled. We have a policy and planning committee on April 26th at 6.30 and a wellness committee on May, May 2nd. Is that when it is, Jay? At 6 o'clock. Yes, thank you. Okay, and are there any other meetings that are scheduled? Yes, okay. at this point in time, as of this morning, just announced um, to yeah, the public, shared, we have a shared services committee. Okay. Uh, meaning that will happen on the 2nd. Uh, of May at 7 p.m. in the town manager's conference room. Oh, I thought I thought it was May 1st. No, this is shared services. Yeah, right. Shared services is May 2nd, not May 1st. Oh, I no, it's oh. a new one that was just right, right. planned. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's this week, right? It is. Let me verify that, yeah. please. Oh, it, did, it does say Wednesday. I... Sorry about that. Not a problem. I just want to make sure. <coughs> All right, the mistake, the mistake is mine. I apologize. It is May 1st. May 1st, Shared Services Committee, gotcha. 7 p.m. May 1st. <laughs> Sorry about that. And that's at 7 o'clock. At 7 o'clock in the Town Manager's Conference Room. Okay. Tuesday, May 1st. All right. Okay. Perfect. All right, is there any unfinished business? No, sit there. Okay, is there anyone wishing to make public comment? Please come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you, we have a five-minute limit. Uh, good evening, David Kruk, 149 Broad Street. I'll try to make it brief. I see there's a lot of people waiting to speak there, well-dressed uh, uh, citizens there. Uh, I have a comment about the mission, well, First, I thought it was a mission statement. The way I, I was watching on TV, was it kind of sounded like a mission statement, but now I hear it's a mission strategic plan, which, it, which makes it a little uh, confusing to me because I'm thinking I heard the back and forth about, well, if it's a, a strategic plan, then you know what are the measures? And, and I thought about that too, and I, I started thinking, well, you included a lot of broad uh, terms in there like uh, creativity, emotional intelligence, uh, critical thinking, how, I don't, I know tw schools nowadays in the 21st century are, are data driven, but, but how, who's going to keep all this data, to, how are you going to keep data of creativity, uh, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, these things are intertwined in every area of the school, not just the courses, but in everything, and in, 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 in to, to have data that is uh, valid and, and especially, I, I don't want to even get into the internal monitoring, but but um, it just seems uh, unfeasible. The the way your your mission uh, statement, mission plan is written, it, it is very broad. And and uh, I was thinking, 
it, it, I guess it could be done. I guess it's ha it has been done. I just don't really know how uh, with, with such broad terms. Uh, and I wrote some notes here because I was afraid I was going to forget. But um, uh, I don't think it's a bad idea. It just, I think maybe just the, the strategic plan it has to be narrowed down a little bit uh, as far as these, the, the terms, the words you're using. Now, as far as the statement, the mission uh, statement, that sounds great as the mission statement. You know, you want all, of course we want our schools to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, teach uh, students emotional intelligence, creativity, critical thinking, but to measure that in, in every course, every subject, every assignment, you know, that's, that's impossible to do. I guess you could do it to some degree, but uh, it, it would really not, you know, to, I don't know how uh, reliable those, uh, that data would be, but um, it just seemed kind of broad. And, uh, and logistically, as I said, it didn't seem feasible. But um, uh, I do agree uh, that um, with Mr. Amit, uh, as he said in the beginning of the presentation, I saw it on TV, it said that uh, uh, nowadays, uh, school, uh, getting a good education goes beyond test scores, and that's true. You just don't want students uh, uh, getting good test scores, and you include a lot of things, uh, citizenship. So I want, and my kids went to school in Wethersfield, and I think the Wethersfield Public Schools prepared my kids to be upstanding citizens, and that's very important. You know, uh, and, and that's one thing good about Wethersfield I always admired. The people in Wethersfield, not just in the school, are respectful, polite. If you, you go stop at a stop sign, if they're from Wethersfield, they're going to stop. They're going to wait. People crossing the street, of scene, they're going to wait for the, the walk sign to go on. They're not just going to jaywalk. Uh, you know. And I grew up in Hartford, and there's not too much following traffic laws in Hartford. But, um, <laughs> but in, in Wethersfield, it's, it's like night and day. Everyone is upstanding citizens. I'm thinking, this is great. This is a great town to live in. With, with, people following the, the traffic rules and, and whatnot. But um, I just think it, the, as far as uh, quantifying all these goals you wrote down, I, just, I guess you could find a way. But, but the, as written, it just seems too broad. Thanks. Thank you. No, I don't think there's anyone else. OK, are there any board comments? John? Thank you. Um, just had to leave his ride was here so i gave him permission to go okay. but having said that he did leave me with some things to say uh, spring sports are out and going as was mentioned by uh, mr maltesi he said the junior prom and the senior ball are being planned and coming along great and uh, will be happening soon uh, i believe the senior ball is the first week of june and the Junior prom is sometime in May, so. This weekend. What's that? This weekend. This weekend. Oh, it's this. Oh, wow, it's early. We weren't planning to go. I know. <laughs> I better get my tux. <laughs> um, so that's Justin. Uh, his report. The other thing he did mention is that the uh, area ranking for baseball is the rank number eight in the state for area ranking this year made the paper today so I did see that as well uh, the teams are doing great and uh, it's even with the backup in weather uh, one other thing that the uh, this year's mayor ball is Friday June 1st it's sold out so if you are planning on going uh, and you have a ticket reserved we would appreciate the payment and uh, because there's a wait list of people that want to go mm -hmm. so it's uh, interesting. So that means we can scalp our tickets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a budget to have. <laughs> Anyone else for board comments? Polly? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of uh, items. Oh, number one, um, I've, I, uh, there's a, a um, stop and shop or a food share uh, fun, uh, food drive to, uh, this weekend at a couple of the uh, stop and shop stores. And um, it's Saturday, uh, April 28th, this coming weekend. Uh, the hours on it are nine to six. And they, um, it, we kind of got a, 
uh, a memo from uh, Food Share today that they are looking for people to help out with that. And uh, even if they have to split up the time, you can't stay the whole day or whatever. So um, keep that in mind. And if anybody's interested in helping out with that, then uh, let me know and I'll forward you the information. The other thing I wanted to mention was that um, the um, Friends of the Library had uh, their spring book sale a couple of weeks ago, and um, they did well. Um, they reduced the price on their books, so um, I ended up not only helping, but taking home even more books than <laughs> usually I do. But one of the things that I did on, um, I went in on the Monday after the, um, the sale, which is historically the day for cleanup. And um, it's, uh, I'm amazed that they're able to get the volunteers that they are, because a, that's a tough day. But one of the things I wanted to mention was um, they were very fortunate this year to have the, um, the help and the support from uh, the Boy Scout Troop 85. Um, and there were um, four young men who were, are working on their uh, reading merit badges. And um, they, but uh, so one of the things that they were doing was the part of the project was to learn more about the public uh, library. And, but the most important thing to me, I mean, obviously I'm delighted that they, uh, they were working toward that, but as a, um, a member of the Friends and as a citizen, I was just so pleased to be working with these four kids. They were fantastic, and they had things packed. They were moving faster than, um, uh, than the rest of us who are <laughs> all of the old people who were just you know, overwhelmed. But um, I just wanted to mention their names. The, uh, um, Gail O'Connor was the chaperone, and she did a great job of keeping them organized. Um, and um, the, uh, the guys' names were Kyle Kunzelman, Ryan uh, Konoshevic, John Saladin, and Ronan O'Connor. And I believe they're all middle school uh, students. So if not all, a couple of them are, but um, middle school and high school, elementary. eighth and ninth. Or no, I'm sorry, uh, elementary and middle school. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, I just wanted to th not only thank them from my own point of view, but really made the work go faster. The other thing is that uh, CABE is having a legislative wrap-up on uh, the 15th of May in the uh, Legislative Office Building, and they are going to address uh, some of the, um, what the legislature has, um, has uh, done for us this year in the way of whether, <laughs> I'm sure they haven't eliminated any mandates, or in, <laughs> so anyway, um, so if uh, you're interested in that, then I think we probably have a, uh, an invitation to that. But it, uh, it is, I have gone in the past, and it is a good program. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, I just want to mention the fact that I, um, on Thursday, April 19th, God bless you, I attended the Keenan Kids Coalition, and you hear me speaking often of them. This is just a wonderful collaborative in town for the benefit of our kids. Um, the agenda started with a review of the current after-school program. It has 950 enrollees for the spring in the elementary schools. But I found the most exciting news is that starting next year, the Keene Foundation is funding the after-school program so that each program for a child is only $10. I mean, they're phenomenal. Um, and this will allow more kids to participate. And you know, this generous foundation looks to even the playing field, one of my favorite sayings in education. But the Keene Foundation has also given money to the Weathersfield Police to attend DARE conferences. This is money from their famous carnival that was earmarked for both the police and fire for ways of helping and protecting our kids. The library was also there, presented by Brooke Berry, who reported on the teen after-school programs, which she um, does a lot of mental activities to try to figure out what these kids want. 108 students participate in such activities as the Oreo Taste Off, Art and Poetry Slam, and the Teen Lounge. I guess that was just yesterday. And Libraries Rock is the theme for the summer reading program. 
As part of this too, the Hunger Action is involved and they're looking for town organizations and schools to adopt a month to work on a food drive. So please go to the Keene Foundation website for more information, uh, you know, another great way to help our town. So, uh, you know, Keene for Kids and the Keene Foundation are an unbelievable support for our students. And the board and the administration, we just say thank you often to them. So I say thank you again. Anyone else? Okay. When is the Oreo taste off? It already <laughs> happened. You missed it. Sorry, you missed it. They said it was like wine tasting, but it was Oreo cookies. <laughs> yeah, they got it. As long as they can dunk them in milk, right? All right, may I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? Okay, a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Nobody's opposed. <laughs> <laughs> Any abstentions? So this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all and good night. John, Nancy's are in my car. And also, are you planning to, are you, did you hear of what we committed to today?